So good evening ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Alex Filipatos and I'm a policy analyst here at the Centre. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, to tonight's event where we'll be discussing a recent and important event regarding multiculturalism in Australia. In the wake of the violent protests in Hyde Park over the anti-Islamic movie The Innocence of Muslims, I'm sure many Australians, including myself, were left shocked thinking how did this ever happen in Australia? Australia is supposed to be a, a laid-back, moderate, civilised country. But seeing a dazed policeman being dragged from a pit of angry masses and placards that read, Behead all, Muslim, Behead all those who insult the Prophet, reflect a brand of extremism that we've seldom seen at home. It forces us to confront the issues and ask ourselves some important questions, such as, what does this mean for the state of multiculturalism in Australia? Are the values that have made Australia a successful immigrant nation under threat? And how should a free society react to this sort of an event? So to help shed some light on these issues and discuss what the protests mean for Australian society, we are joined tonight by my, f my fellow colleagues, Benjamin Herskovich, who is a policy, an policy analyst here at the Centre, uh, research fellow, Dr Jeremy Salmon, and uh, Reverend Peter Curdy. So the format for tonight is that uh, each speaker will speak for roughly 10 minutes and then we'll open up for some questions and then we'll finish at around 10 past 7, quarter past 7 at the latest. And just as a reminder, uh, we're filming this event, so it's being streamed live as well. So if you don't want to be filmed, um, probably best not to, answer, not to ask a question. Uh, so without further ado, I'm not going to keep, keep you long. I'd like to welcome up our first speaker, Benjamin Herskovich. Thank you very much for the introduction, Alex, and thank you very much for being here tonight. The violent protest two weeks ago in Sydney CBD by Muslim activists prompted much strident rhetoric about the health of Australia's multicultural society. Jared Henderson, executive director of the Sydney Institute, summed up the mood when he claimed the riot provided yet more evidence that multiculturalism, after a promising start, has failed. However, before we accept invitations to be multiculturalism's pallbearers, we need to carefully take stock of both multiculturalism's meaning for Australia and the state of its health. Tonight, in that vein, I want to do two things. Firstly, I want to offer an explanation as to why Australia is multicultural. And then secondly, I want to briefly look at some of the indicators of the health of Australia's multicultural society. The short story, to give the argument in one sentence, is that multiculturalism is actually tied to the very core of our liberal democratic values, while our culturally diverse society remains open and healthy. If we search the literature and Australia's history, we can find many explanations for why Australia is multicultural. Part of the story is undoubtedly geopolitical, Global conflicts and upheavals over the centuries have produced waves of new Australians. Famine in Ireland, total war and genocide in continental Europe, civil war in Indochina and Sri Lanka, state collapse in sub-Saharan Africa, and much beside has led many to seek out Australia. Another part of the explanation is probably psychological. We have long had an impulse to populate this wide country. Post-World War II, we were told we needed to populate or perish. And now the idea that Australia needs to be big and wealthy to compete in the century of Asian giants is gaining ground. At the same time, though, economics cannot be overlooked. A steady stream of immigration throughout Australia's history has provided hands to keep the wheels of industry turning. Leaving a psychologically and physically shattered Europe after 1945, Europeans of many religions and languages came here to build the Australia of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme, as well as corporate giants such as the Westfield Group. New Australians from Asia are now bringing a wealth of technical expertise to Australia's hospitals, financial institutions and universities. All of these explanations are plausible up to a certain point. They highlight elements of Australia's multicultural story and provide partial justifications of our multicultural policies. However, they ignore the crucial connection between Australian values and multiculturalism. 
Indeed, what I want to argue tonight is that multiculturalism is not a challenge to Australian values because multiculturalism is actually the logical outgrowth of our values. The values that define Australia more than any others are liberal democratic values. Like any liberal democracy, Australia's record is not perfect. Nevertheless, our story is remarkable and it is a story of which we should all be proud. Since 1901, Australia has been one of only six countries throughout the world to remain consistently liberal and democratic. This is partly explained by good fortune, obviously. We have been far from the voracious belligerence of imperial and Nazi Germany, Tsarist and communist Russia, as well as imperial Japan. Not quite as far away from imperial Japan, but still far enough away. It is still noteworthy, though, that despite all of the vagaries of history, and notwithstanding backsliding from time to time, Australia has steadfastly held to liberal democratic values. These values inform every aspect of our political and legal systems and shape the nature of our public discourse. Perhaps surprisingly to some, the place of liberal democratic values at the very core of our national life means multiculturalism must remain a central element of the Australian social contract. Put simply, liberal democratic values entail a commitment to multiculturalism. A commitment to liberal rights and freedoms is counterfeit unless it comes with a commitment to cultural diversity. If we want to, as the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman put it, preserve the maximum degree of freedom for each individual separately that is compatible with one man's freedom not interfering with other men's freedom, then we must allow for a flourishing of cultural diversity. The liberal commitment to allowing individuals to live as they see fit, provided they do not infringe on the freedoms of others, entails tolerance of diversity in all its forms, including cultural diversity. Crucially though, just as surely as our liberal democratic values entail a commitment to multiculturalism, the health of our multicultural society rests on a shared commitment to liberal democratic values. There is something very circular about this. Unless diverse groups respect liberal rights and freedoms and democratic processes, peaceful coexistence cannot be assured. As former Prime Minister John Howard put it in the wake of the Cronulla Rights in, I think, quite an eloquent and simplistic way, a sense of shared values is our social cement. Without it, we risk becoming a society governed by coercion rather than consent. The connection between Australia's liberal democratic values and multiculturalism acknowledged, some questions remain outstanding. Is cultural diversity straining our liberal democratic consensus? Do we risk becoming a society governed by coercion because we cannot agree on the principles that should hold our society together? I now want to answer these questions indirectly by briefly considering some indicators of the health of Australian multiculturalism. Although this is obviously a difficult thing to measure in precise terms, there are some useful, if fairly rough, proxies. A multicultural society cannot function well if new arrivals do not become productive members of the broader community. In the Australian case, the evidence shows that the story is overwhelmingly positive. Shortly after arriving in Australia, 84.4% of new arrivals from the skilled migration stream, which is almost 70% of the overall migration program, were employed. Only 4.8% were unemployed, while 10.8% did not have an income but were studying or caring for someone or doing something similar. This compares very favorably with the national unemployment rate of 5.1%. In fact, it's lower. Although only 50.3% of new arrivals from the family migration stream were employed, while 41.7% were studying or caring for someone, their rate of unemployment was still relatively low at 8.1%. Given that employment is the engine of both prosperity and engagement with the broader community, this is an important result. If we now turn to Australian attitudes towards cultural diversity, we find that the story is similarly encouraging. In a recent survey of over 12,000 Australians, 
led by a team of academics from five Australian universities, 86.8% of respondents agreed that it is a good thing for a society to be made up of people from different cultures. More than half of the respondents said they mix with members of different cultural groups, often or very often in the workplace, while just under half do the same socially. Analysis of the 2006 census confirms healthy levels of interaction between different cultures in Australian society. The spouses were of different ancestries in 30% of all couples, while the rate of intermarriage has been increasing with each successive generation, regardless of ethnic background. As well as having diverse families, Australia has comparably low levels of residential segregation. Australians are more likely to be living in mixed neighbourhoods than their British, Canadian, and in particular, American counterparts. All of this might seem irrelevant to the debate, all of these facts about the makeup of Australian society and how different people in our society interact, but it is actually fundamentally important because what it shows is that in Australian society, we do not have groups that are segregated from the mainstream. There is a huge amount of interaction. People are well integrated to the society as a whole. With an open society in which the vast majority of new arrivals quickly become productive members of the broader community, Australian multiculturalism has not produced the kinds of social divisions seen in European countries such as France or Great Britain. Admittedly, this is by no means an exhaustive analysis of the indicators of the health of Australian multiculturalism. It would be foolishly bold to claim anything else. Having said all of that though, it does strongly suggest that just as surely as Australia's liberal democratic values entail a commitment to multiculturalism, the lived experiences of Australians show that we remain a resounding multicultural success story. To conclude, given how well the Australian model of multiculturalism works, it is perhaps apt to paraphrase something former Prime Minister John Howard said on Australia Day in 2006, a month and a half after the Cronulla riots. Although criminal behaviour should be met with the full force of the law, it does not call for either self-flagellation or moral panic. Our response should reflect this nation's unwavering commitment to diversity and tolerance, coupled with a determination to ensure Australia's liberal democratic values bind all parts of our community together. Thank you very much, and I'll pass on to Peter. Thank you, Ben. Well, Ben closed his remarks there by referring to uh, John Howard's remarks about the importance of tolerance in our society. So I want to ask the question, do we need still to talk about tolerance? And yes, I rather think we do, frankly. I certainly think that tolerance is one of the key normative principles uh, of what I'm going to refer to as civil society. Put in its simplest terms, I want to suggest that civil society can be thought of as a complex of freedoms, a complex of freedoms and rights and common commitments and procedures, of course, for peaceful dispute resolution. Take those together, we can think of civil society as an arena, if you like, where people associate voluntarily to agree a balance between these two things. On the one hand, the interests of the individual, and on the other hand, the needs of the communal. As such, I think that this arena that I'm calling civil society will always be marked by a degree of tension between the pursuit of those individual interests and the securing of the common good. I want to suggest that the health of a liberal democracy can in fact be gauged by the extent to which civil society is able to strike a balance between the public and the private spheres of communal life. On the one hand, an unduly enthusiastic concern on the part of the Commonwealth to preserve the shared common sphere can frustrate and even stifle individual endeavour, as Ben has um, foreshadowed. On the other hand, aggressive individual action can frustrate the pursuit of the shared common life, the shared sphere of common life. The ends of men are many, as Isaiah Berlin once observed, and not all of them are, in principle, compatible with one another. 
In fact, it was the emergence of this idea of the ends of men in the early modern period which first gave rise to the notion of what we call tolerance. Martin Luther insisted on the right of personal religious belief, free of ecclesiastical control, as long as the civil order was neither disturbed nor disrupted. And thinkers throughout the 16th and 17th centuries defended that right. As the writer Bruce Sievers has noted, with the rise of the idea of individual conscience as a challenge to, single sta to a single state-imposed belief system, toleration became a way of reconciling radically divergent views and concepts of human community. So, tolerance is the means by which we mediate between two characteristic commitments of civil society, the commitment to the rights of the individual and the commitment to the common good as upheld by the state. But tolerance is not particularly fashionable at the moment. A lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea of tolerance, and I suspect for one reason. Because tolerance implies the need to make a judgment. The exercise of tolerance, I want to suggest, requires the expression of strong moral conviction. So if I tolerate something, I'm letting something be that I find objectionable or undesirable. Despite its badness, I want to say, I want to say that the thing that I tolerate should be left alone. Now, the exercise of that kind of conviction or judgment brings down the opprobrium of such luminaries as comedians and social commentators who appear on Q&A. And what these critics demand is not tolerance at all. What they demand is neutrality. These critics say that standards of belief or conduct are entirely subjective. You can't make a judgment about anything, they say. Who are you to judge? But I want to ask, is it really more acceptable to practice neutrality than tolerance? I'll show you a picture. You'll know this picture. It had a lot of attention uh, over the last few days. A picture of a child, if you can see it against the lights, a picture of a child holding up a sign being photographed by her mother, who may or may not be able to read English, that says, Behold, behead all those who insult the prophet. It's an extraordinary picture and a disconcerting picture for many reasons, one of which I think is that we can be pretty sure that it's not going to be an Australian court that determines the meaning of the word insult. Well, if I remain neutral about that sign, I think I actually rule out use of the concepts of good or bad when talking about it. I'll be placing it, uh, placing habits of behavior such as this beyond public appraisal into a completely private realm. And if I remain neutral about this sign, I think I also rule out the possibility of exercising my moral judgment about our common life as an Australian society. In other words, if I remain neutral about it, I'm not really able to say, I don't care to see signs like that paraded through the streets of Australian cities. Do we have to care about the common life, though? Can we avoid it? Well, I don't think so, especially if we hope to develop rather than abandon the Australian multicultural project. As Ben has said, the idea of a multicultural society is one that allows cultures complete freedom to develop in a country regardless of whether they conform to what the English philosopher Roger Scruton calls the prevailing root standards of behaviour. In other words, in multiculturalism, in full-blooded multiculturalism, cuts us loose from those root standards of behavior. It's not enough to say that we have people of diverse backgrounds mixing together. I'm, as you can tell, a migrant to this country. I'm married to an American. Okay, we're white and we speak English, but there is a commingling of cultures there, believe you me. The, if we cut, sh cut ourselves loose from the root standards of behavior, I think the multicultural project begins to unravel. And the point that Scruton is making is that the, uh, the proponents of full-blooded multiculturalism argue that those prevailing roots don't need to take hold. They don't need to be, uh, they don't need to be secured. And multiculturalism, multi, but multiculturalism, of course, does have its critics. And as Roger Scruton argues, those critics of multiculturalism, he says, and it's a, it's, he's writing in an English context in particular, are not racists. Rather, they are, he says, trying to remind people, and I'm quoting him, that we in the West enjoy a single political culture with the nation-state as the object of a common loyalty and a secular conception of law which makes religion a concern of family and society, but not of the state. And Scruton goes on to make what I think is a very important point. 
He says, people who see all law, all social identity, and all loyalty as issuing from a religious source cannot really form part of this political culture, and they will not recognize either the obligation to the state or the love of country on which it is founded. The idea then is of a shared form of life, a common form of life, within which cultural diversity is not just wholly acceptable, it is wholly to be welcomed. The kind of cultural diversity that is not compatible with civil society is that which rejects the constitutive principles and practices that give that society its identity. In an article published in the, on the drum last Monday, which you may have seen, Geoffrey Levy argued that Australian multiculturalism actually protects the shared values of our common life by preventing one form of life from dominating. Australian multiculturalism, uh, Levy said, aims to extend liberty and equality to all within the same liberal democratic limits and so allow all Australians the same opportunities and sense of belonging. But I think Levy's got it the wrong way round. I would want to argue that it's not multiculturalism that secures the curtilage of a common way of life. It's the rule of law that does that. So if I'm not to remain neutral about that sign, is it something that I think I can tolerate? Well, yes, I think I can tolerate it. I certainly don't like it. And as I've said, the things that we tolerate are invariably the things that we don't like very much. But I don't think that it should be banned. I have no wish whatsoever for the rule of law to encroach so completely on my way of life as to reduce my right or your right to freedom of speech. So I don't support the recent demand made by Upper, but New South Wales Upper House uh, MP Shoket Mosulman for yet more restrictions on our freedom of speech. And of course, if people are free to carry around signs such as this, I in turn am free to stand here and say that I think it a despicable thing to call for anyone's decapitation. But whilst I can tolerate this sign, I do think it does impose a degree of strain on the fabric of our common life. For one thing, it's cruel and barbaric. And as such, signals, I think, a refusal on the part of those who prepare, make, carry and photograph such placards to recognise that those of us who don't share the Islamist worldview are nonetheless fellow members of Australian society. I am quite certain uh, that the majority of Australian Muslims want to live here in peace, to raise their kids safely, to enjoy the free and wonderful lifestyle of this country. But a sizable minority has a darker purpose, and that purpose is to open and inflame what spokesmen for the global Islamist movement Hizbut Tahrir have described as the deep-seated tensions between Muslims and the West. And I have to say that despite the smooth assurances of those spokesmen of Hizbut Tahrir, I have my doubts that any hospitality extended by a restored Muslim caliphate to non-believers would be gentle. Islam is not just a religion. It has a political identity and commands an allegiance from the community of believers, the Ummah. And that allegiance transcends what we understand as allegiance to the secular nation state. As the Gateshead Institute's Michael Curtis observes, the Islamist ambition is the exercise of power and control and the imposition of Sharia law, which is not limited by the boundaries of individual nation states. So that's one area of strain, I think, suggested by the display of that placard. But there is another, for there is something peculiar about the human ecology of these protesters. They speak about peace, yet urge violence. They demand respect, yet deride their critics. They assert a place in this country and yet appear to have their root standards of behaviour sunk and sunk quite deeply elsewhere. Roger Cohen, writing the other day in the New York Times, remarked, there are too many hypocrisies in Islam, deploring attacks on it while often casting scorn on Judaism and Christianity, all that stuff about their dead being in paradise, claiming the mantle of peace whilst inspiring violence. Inv well, inspiring violence. Well, in conclusion, I want to maintain that notwithstanding the strains imposed by displays of placards such as that, Australian society does have the ability to tolerate opinions or behaviour with which many of its members might not necessarily agree. It's one of the things that makes this country a great, varied, diverse and strong country, in my view. And it has this ability because it is founded on a territorial jurisdiction that regards the sovereignty of the state as the source of law. 
So I want to propose that tolerance is indeed a norm of our society that allows each member of our society to live with one another in peace. And I call for the exercise of tolerance and not for the exercise of neutrality. But the exercise of tolerance must always depend upon a commitment to upholding a common way of life, a commitment that can only be grounded, I want to suggest, in a common political and legal culture. And demands for any kind of tolerance that refuse to tolerate differences in the way that common life is pursued is no tolerance at all. As Professor James Allen observed recently, in a healthy democracy, if you don't like someone else's point of view, you respond by saying why. You don't threaten murder. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> having heard Peter's speech now, I'm going to be picking up a few of his themes in my talk tonight. A number of curious assumptions underpin what I will describe tonight as the multicultural mindset. By this I mean the set of ideas uh, about multiculturalism commonly ascribed to by elites in politics, government and academia. These ideas have for the last 40 years or so shaped thinking about how we should deal with racial and, rel and religious difference in a multiracial or multi-ethnic society. I think it's important to examine these assumptions and unpack these curiosities at this time, firstly because these assumptions are being mugged by reality. I also fear that, that despite the facts changing, minds will not. The multicultural mindset threatens to shape the response to the violent is Islamist riots in Sydney and elsewhere in ways that will be harmful to the principles of a free and tolerant society. When the official policy was formulated in the 1960s, the proponents of multiculturalism believed that cultural diversity was such a desirable social good that the force of law should be used to achieve this goal. The challenge, as the multiculturalists saw it, was to overcome opposition to coloured or alien immigration, as it was called in Britain and Australia respectively. Racism would be stamped out by making all forms of racial prejudice illegal under legislation such as the Australian Racial Discrimination Act and the UK Race Relations Act. This has always struck me as a curious way to go about trying to create a multicultural nation. The guiding assumption behind the multicultural project was that Australia was a racist country and these attitudes needed to be socially engineered out of the national soul at the end of the barrel of the RDA. If this was true, then a non-discriminatory immigration policy would be a very bad idea. Imagine the kind of society that would be created a society beset by racial and ethnic divisions which end endlessly dragged citizens into court for discrimination against newcomers. Fortunately, there has never been huge numbers of racial discrimination cases in Australia. Last year, for example, there were only about 100 cases before the Australian Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission. This is a tribute to Australia's overall success in creating an overwhelmingly tolerant multiracial society. The credit, of course, shouldn't go to the RDA. Any idea that the threat of legal action stopped ordinary Australians from being racist is ridiculous. The credit goes to ordinary Australians, the vast majority of whom have been accepting of millions of people who have migrated since World War II. Daily life in this country is proof that Australians can live and let live alongside fellow citizens of all colours and creeds. This is a national achievement which was without local or international precedent until the second half of the 20th century. Furthermore, a harmonious multiracial society is an achievement which our forebears did not believe was possible. So impossible did they believe this to be that preventing the consequences of what they called racial admixture was a key, was a key rationale of the exclusionary immigration policy known as the White Australia policy established in 1901. The men who then governed Australia believed that racial and cultural differences would divide the nation into hostile camps. What was feared was the creation of a society politically divided based on colour and creed a society in which race baiting and religious bigotry would form the central political dynamic. These fears have now been disproven by the success of contemporary Australia's non-discriminatory immigration program. But a prudent nation committed to immigration like Australia should not take this for granted. We should always take seriously the integration of migrants and pay attention to factors that might limit integration, such as the size and composition of the migrant intake. Ultimately, 
ensuring we remain a harmonious multi-ethnic society comes down to ensuring migrants are or become culturally compatible with the essential values of Australian society. Multiculturalists over the journey have tended to find this an uncomfortable issue. Words like integration and, and compatibility undercut the central tenet of multiculturalism, which is that migrants have the right to keep their cultural identity to promote diversity. At worst, these words have been condemned as racist code expressed by those who yearn for the homogeneity of old Australia. Critics of multiculturalism who have argued we should be wary of encouraging cultural divisions and that immigration and citizenship policy should place a greater emphasis on integration rather than diversity have also been dismissed either as, uh, as alarmists or populists pandering to old fears and prejudices. However, the assumption that disharmony in a multicultural society always stems from recalcitrant Australian racism has been discredited by the right. We are now confronting that strange brew, homegrown, foreign imported Islamofascism. In response, some multiculturalists have been quick to reassure us that, that the law will again do its job, this time by dealing with the criminal acts committed by a few rioters. This was the first occasion on which internationally coordinated violent Islamist demonstrations touched Australian shores. I hope there is no repeat. But this may be a vain hope, given the repeat episodes in other parts of the world. If radical Muslims have to be continually dragged before the courts for politically motivated crimes, this will be a terrible commentary on the uncivil state of Australia's liberal democracy. The let the court sort them out sentiment suggests that the problem is just the criminal behaviour of the rioters. This minimises the riot's true significance. I wish we were just dealing with a criminal problem. What cannot be ignored is the broader and more alarming issue, the motivations of the violent and non-violent demonstrators alike. The real issue is the fact that there is present in Australia an apparently growing sect of religious fanatics with a political agenda hostile to liberal democratic values, an agenda which only starts with curbing the right to free speech. That a group is so dramatically disintegrated from mainstream society points to another flawed assumption of the multicultural mindset, the failure to take culture seriously. While they preach the benefits of cultural diversity, I think that many of the elites who support multiculturalism, for all their cosmopolitan sophistication, are culturally naive. They fundamentally, fundamentally believe that all human beings have the same core values and that people are more or less just like them. This is the multiculturalism just means better restaurants view of the world. In reality, different cultures can produce very different core values. To coin a phrase, multiculturalism means you might get hummus, but you might also get Hamas as well. <coughs> <coughs> Elites have a particular cultural blind spot when it comes to religion. Because they are secular progressives and don't take God seriously, they think no one else does either. Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore expressed something of this when she said on Q&A that the rioters were the equivalent of a gang of drunken Aussie youths rampaging up the cross on a Saturday night. Anyone who saw the protesters chanting Allah Akbar knows that the comparison is, abs is absurd. Maybe the Lord Mayor thinks Allah Akbar is a late night kebab joint in Woolloomooloo. <laughs> Thanks. If I'm right about the problems with the multicultural mindset, then I fear that the errors have only just begun. Much will depend on the extent to which the riots are blamed on Islamophobia, either on that film that was the pretext for the demonstrations, or on the discrimination and prejudice it is claimed that, that Muslims routinely experience in Western countries, to which people from Muslim countries nevertheless continue to flock. No matter what you might say about the Islamists, they are politically astute, and their rhetoric has internalised the logic of the multiculturalists. Hence the following argument has been advanced in supposed defence or justification of the violent demonstrations. The Islamist mob has rioted and demanded, if not literal beheadings, then at least the metaphorical cutting out of the tongues of those who insult Islam, because Islamophobes keep on saying that Islam is a violent and intolerant religion. The argument is obviously self-defeating, but playing the victim just might work. For what it does is shift attention back to the topic multiculturalists are always comfortable talking about the so-called racism against minorities. Legitimising the grievances of the mob in this fashion is a long way from treating the protesters as criminals and it gets us back where we began regarding the, the use of law in the pursuit of, a, of multicultural harmony. It's not at all far-fetched to suggest that multiculturalists might look with favour on a legal remedy 
which in the name of respecting diversity and preventing further turmoil, outlawed provocative and sure to be termed hate speech against Islam. Many commentators have pointed out the real threat now posed to free speech because Western governments seem unwilling to defend fundamental values. Witness the indecent haste with which the Obama administration apologised to the killers of the US ambassador to Libya for the offence taken to that film. Concerns that governments will seek to reach a political accommodation by appeasing Islamofascist grievances are not overstated. The multicultural mindset has intellectually programmed many elites to pursue this course. If that's the case, then the multicultural mindset should be recognised for what it has now become, a threat to freedom. Thank you.